Destiny Renee Pittman was born on January 9, 1992, to her loving parents, Melvin L., Douglas Jr. and Carla A. Pittman McCombs. She was one of five siblings, including two brothers, Brandon McCombs and Seth Pickett, and two sisters, Cheyenne McCombs and Mackenzie Douglas. Together, they grew up in Kokomo, where they enjoyed a joyful and happy family life. By 2013, at the age of 21, Destiny had moved out of her parents' home but remained in Kokomo, living with a roommate in an apartment on the 800 block of James Drive. She had also been in a relationship for over a year, though her boyfriend's identity was never made public. Destiny and her boyfriend shared a risky venture. They occasionally sold marijuana for extra income, which put them in contact with dangerous individuals. On February 7, 2013, Destiny, her boyfriend, and her roommate were enjoying a quiet evening in their apartment on James Drive, with no plans for the night. What they didn't realize was that their peaceful evening was about to be disrupted by complete chaos. At around 9.20 p.m. that night, there was a commotion outside their door. Destiny went outside to see what was happening, and moments later her boyfriend and roommate heard raised voices, and someone screaming in rage, asking for the location of something. Then they heard a loud gunshot, which terrified them, and they both hid inside the apartment. The intruders then entered the house, but luckily did not find the boyfriend or the roommate, and left soon after. At 9.33 p.m., officers from the Kokomo Police Department responded to reports of shooting from 800 James Drive. When they arrived, they found Destiny dead outside her apartment, bleeding from a single gunshot wound to her chest. A single 40 caliber shell casing was recovered from the scene, and they found that the bullet had flown straight through Destiny before striking the wall behind her. When police questioned her boyfriend and roommate about the invaders, they learned that the two of them had not seen them at all, except for a glimpse of their shoes. When questioned if they knew of any motive behind the robbery, Destiny's boyfriend admitted to the police that he had sold marijuana and had taken a bag containing weed and over $2,000 in cash to another house, just days prior to the home invasion. He also told them that Destiny too had her own business selling marijuana, though she had decreased her involvement in this venture after she had recently inherited some money. Police noted that Destiny's stash of marijuana and cash was missing from the apartment, and realized that the robbery had likely been the prime motive behind the murder. After this, they took a look at people who used to buy weed from Destiny and her boyfriend, but none of these potential suspects panned out in the investigation. Eventually, the trail went cold and the investigation fizzled out. For nine long years, the case lay cold, and police had no idea how they would ever find new suspects with the severe lack of evidence and information that was available. But when they were least expecting it, on December 5, 2022, they got a new lead completely out of the blue. They received a voicemail from an informant, who claimed to have information about the murder of Destiny Pittman. The informant, whose identity has not been released to protect their confidentiality, stated that they were with two brothers, 32-year-old Joey McCartney and 36-year-old Jesse McCartney, on the night Destiny was killed. They said that it was these two brothers who had killed and robbed Destiny that night. The informant then went over the events of that night with the police. The informant claimed Jesse and Joey said they were running an errand and that the informant tagged along. The informant said that they had been sitting in Jesse McCartney's Jeep outside the James Drive apartment when both the McCartneys had left the car and entered the house. The informant then heard a gunshot and saw both men come running out of the house. Jesse was apparently sweating heavily and was carrying a large bag of marijuana in one hand and a wad of cash in the other. The informant also described the gun Jesse had owned and told the police that six months after that night, Jesse had sold both his gun and Jeep to cover his tracks. The informant also took the police to the exact house where the killing had happened and pointed out where they had waited in the car and which apartment the McCartneys had entered. The informant told the police that they had taken so long to come forward because they were terrified of Jesse. But eventually, the guilt of knowing what had happened had been too much, and they felt they had to tell the truth. He also told the police that Jesse McCartney had since changed his phone number, but still lived in Kokomo on Monroe Street. They also informed the police of Joey McCartney's location, and that he now lived in Kentucky. Having got all this information, detectives from the Kokomo Police Department, working along with the U.S. Marshals, 
arrested the brothers Jesse and Joey McCartney in February 2023 for the murder of Destiny Pittman. The brothers have pleaded not guilty, and the case will now go on trial. Before we dive in, don't forget to subscribe to our new channel, where we uncover captivating and chilling cold cases that will keep you on the edge of your seat. You won't want to miss the twists and turns we have in store. Okay, let's continue. 24-year-old Petra Knoll lay lifeless, like a broken doll, strangled by an unknown attacker behind a beer stand. A young single mother, Petra was living with her parents and her one-year-old daughter at the time. Separated from the child's father, she was raising her daughter alone. On the night before her body was discovered, February 13, 1988, Petra decided to take a break and enjoy the carnival with friends. She spent the evening partying with two friends at a club called Sherivari. Sherivari was located in Beerdorf, Cologne, a lively tourist spot known as Beer Village, home to various pubs and cafes. The club itself was in the basement of a mall named Lannenstadt, now known as Topran Passagen. Around 4 a.m. on February 14th, Petra decided to head to another club called Big Ben. Low on money, she borrowed 100 Deutschmarks from a friend before leaving. Sadly, she never made it to her destination. Instead, the morning of the parade, police officers and forensic professionals milled around her body, while the parade, which was in full swing, took place only a few meters away near the Shoal and Wiedelshack. While the parade was not canceled when news of the gruesome incident emerged, that particular area was cordoned off, and the police made sure no spectators were allowed accidentally or otherwise on the scene. The unsolved murder of Petra Null was considered one of the biggest ever cases in Cologne's criminal history. For a time, the detectives pursued any lead they found, however slim. Unfortunately, they all led to dead ends. With no new leads and no further information, the case was deemed a cold case. It looked as though Petra Null would never receive justice and her family would never know peace. For 34 years, the case continued to baffle the investigators. How was it that no one had noticed anything out of the ordinary? Surely, there would have been sounds of a scuffle. How could nobody have heard anything? These questions continued to plague the officers. 34 years after Petra was murdered, her case was reopened in cooperation with the Special Organizational Structure, BAO, Cold Cases of the State Criminal Police Office of North Rhine-Westphalia. The case was also featured on the ZDF show, Atkinjine XY, a television crime program on the December 7, 2022. This proved to be the break that investigators were looking for. Once the show was over, five people called and offered new leads invigorated. At the thought of finally bringing Petra's murder to justice, they investigated all the leads carefully and thoroughly. Ultimately, this resulted in a valuable tip from a possible witness, which eventually led to the arrest of a suspect. When the case was broadcast on the Octungsizen XY program in December 2022, a man at the Munich recording studio immediately came forward as a witness during the broadcast. The Cologne officials wasted no time in contacting him. During his questioning, he described in detail the course of the evening. It was the early hours of February 14, 1988, and it was Carnival Saturday. He had spent some time living it up with a friend in the Beer Village and the Shiver nightclub. Petra Knoll was also there, celebrating Carnival Saturday. As the time of the crime grew nearer, he remembered wanting to go back home, and his friend expressed the same desire as well. In perfect accord, the two men made their way to a taxi stand in Tunisstras. There they met Petra Knoll and struck up a friendly conversation. As it happens, taxis were in extremely short supply due to the carnival, so the group decided to move on to Newmark, hoping to find taxis there. As they walked and chatted, the two friends parted ways as their wait for a taxi proved to be very long. The witness remained at the stand, while his friend followed Petra in the direction of Newmark. The next day, the media reported on the homicide. Upon hearing what had happened, the witness wanted to go to the police and report on the happenings of the previous night. His friend at the time refused to do so quite vehemently, and convinced the witness that no good would come of it. Out of respect for his friend, the witness let the matter drop and decided against making a statement to the police. 34 years later, the witness watched the show. 34 years later, the two men were no longer friends either. 
When he saw a photograph of Petra, he recognized her immediately and came forward with his statement. While he described the evening to the officers in explicit detail, he did not initially want to share his friend's name. The officers spoke to the witness and convinced him to do so. Forensics came forward with details, which allowed them to have greater clarity on the matter. Fiber traces found on Petra indicated the murderer was probably wearing a black leather jacket, moon wash jeans, and cognac brown shoes, possibly cowboy boots. Noel's black purse containing her neck pouch was missing. The pouch probably contained the 100 Deutschmarks borrowed from her friend, and possibly, also tokens used to buy drinks in the Bierdorf Cologne. On February 14, 2023, exactly 34 years to the day that Petra Noel had been murdered, the police arrested a 56-year-old suspect from the Cologne district of Bilderstachen. The suspect's name has not been released to the public at this time. The suspect claimed that he could not remember the murder during an initial interrogation. However, his DNA profile was matched to DNA traces found on the victim. The suspect did not know Petra personally, and so the officers deduced the crime was probably one of greed by a then young 21-year-old man, too drunk and greedy to know better. At the present, the suspect has denied the crime, but he did not resist arrest. He will now be charged with the murder, and Petra's family can finally begin a long and painful journey to closure. On January 28, 2012, Police received a call from Yvonne Johnson reporting that her son had found something unusual while cleaning the yard. When officers arrived at Brookhaven Trailer Park in Opelika, Alabama, they were shocked to discover a toddler's skull. A search of the area behind a nearby trailer uncovered more remains, including a few bones and a small bundle of curly hair. Additional evidence was found in a creek nearby, where police recovered a pink long-sleeve shirt. The shirt featured little heart buttons and floral ruffles around the neckline. The remains were determined to belong to a child, likely between the ages of four and seven. The case, both tragic and complex, led investigators to start with the basics. The remains were sent to the FBI laboratory in Quantico, Virginia, to try to identify the child and conduct an autopsy. Sadly, the heartache surrounding the case was far from over. The reports revealed baffling details that the remains belonged to a four to seven-year-old African-American female child who had suffered blunt force trauma that caused more than 15 fractures in the bones of her skull, legs, arms, ribs, and shoulders. Not only that, she was also severely malnourished and showed signs of abuse as there was evidence of her previous injuries being healed. She seemed to have had a fractured eye socket in her left eye which led the forensic team to believe that she was blind in her left eye. Her death, considered a homicide, likely occurred between the summers of 2010-2011. No amount of investigation led the police to the baby's family. That was when the unnamed child was given the name Opelika's baby Jane Doe, who became beloved in the community. Everyone tried finding the answers after the detectives released the information to the public, but the mysteries of the case were not revealed. After almost four years, in 2016, a picture of a girl surfaced that could have been the Jane Doe. The police noticed that the picture was taken at Opelika's Greater Peace Baptist Church Bible School around 2011. The location seemed to be a match. The child looked neglected. She had a visible deformity on her eye, and the timeline fell into place, too. The detectives saw a ray of hope. They believed that they would finally be able to reach baby Jane Doe's family but all the efforts to locate the baby in the picture were proven unsuccessful. The teacher at the school could not recall the name of the child, but remembered her as a quiet person who liked to be alone and struggled to communicate with others the church hadn't started officially registering the students. So they did not have any records for the child seen in the picture, so the detectives did the next best thing by enhancing the low quality, grainy pictures provided by the church and publishing them so that someone could bring in useful information. The police even tried getting help from DNA testing, but the conditions of her remains did not allow any such procedure to be followed. The officers had no option but to wait for information from the public and continue their investigation. A decade passed by, but baby Jane Doe was still a mystery. During this period, between 2012 and 2022, the police went over 15,000 case files to try and find the identity of baby Jane Doe, but all their efforts were in vain. Despite thousands of tips, 
neither the baby nor her killer could be identified. With the development of DNA technology in January 2022, the detectives hoped that they could extract something substantial now. A DNA profile was built on the sample collected from her scalp and hair by Othram Laboratories and Astria Forensics. The forensics case was assigned to the renowned Dr. Barbara Ray Venter. Finally, in October 2022, with the help of genetic genealogy, Dr. Barbara was successful in identifying the father of baby Jane as Lamar Vickerstaff. He was born and brought up in Opelika, Alabama and had served in the U.S. Navy, because of which he had resided in Honolulu, Norfolk, and Jacksonville. After this discovery, the police immediately traveled to Mayport Naval Station in Jacksonville, where Lamar was stationed at the time, to inform him of his daughter's death. But he was a no-show. After waiting for several hours, the police finally tracked him down. He provided no information about baby Jane Doe's identity to the detectives. Then the police questioned his wife, Ruth Vickerstaff, who had been married to him since 2006. She informed the police that she did not know Lamar's daughter or her mother. In December 2022, despite so many failed efforts, the police did not give up. Out of all the possible matches of women linked to Lamar around 2006, they figured out that baby Jane Doe's mother was 37-year-old Sherry Wiggins, native of Norfolk, Virginia. She identified the baby as her own daughter, Amore Javia Wiggins, who was born in 2006. The twists and turns of this case were over yet, as Sherry did not even know that her daughter, for whom she had been paying child support for all these years, had been missing for more than a decade. She told the officers everything that had happened after Amory's birth in 2006. Sherry met LeVar Vickerstaff at the age of 19, as they had lived in the same apartment complex. He was a 35-year-old Navy officer and they quickly began a romantic relationship. One day, when Sherry realized that she was pregnant, they moved in together. However, the Vickerstaff family was not happy with him having a baby without getting married. Since they did not plan on getting married anytime soon, Lamar started being upset about his family all the time. Before long, he began showing aggressive tendencies towards Sherry, so Sherry planned to take some action and move out. Then on January 1, 2006, Amore Jovea Wiggins was born in Norfolk, Virginia. Sherry named her Amore, meaning love in Spanish, and she was full of love and smiles. Amore was a happy child who didn't cry a lot. She was smart and special, but Lamar did not seem to care about that. He didn't take any part in Amore's early life. He was always absent. So Sherry went to court to try and get full custody of her child. By that time, Lamar had married Ruth in the same year, 2006. Sherry confessed that she had made many mistakes around that time. There had been misdemeanor reports against her which did not work out in her favor at all and the legal custody of Amore was given to her father in 2009, while Sherry was not even given a visitation allowance. She tried fighting this decision by appealing to the court for years, but in 2013, she was informed that her appeals had been exhausted. So Sherry waited. She longed for Amore to turn 18 so that she could finally see her. Sherry told the police that she was not able to be a part of her upbringing, but she had paid child support ever since 2009 to support her daughter financially, and she was happy to do whatever she could to be involved in Amori's life. Little did she know that Amori's own father would be responsible for her death. After learning all this, police tried reaching out to school boards and pediatric clinics in the states that Lamar had previously resided in and the neighboring ones too, but they did not find any records, concluding that Amori was never enrolled in a school and was not even reported missing. Finally, on January 17, 2023, Lamar Vickerstaff was arrested for felony murder, and his wife, Ruth Vickerstaff, was taken into custody for failure to report a missing persons report. The police built a strong case against the Vickerstaffs, and the hearing was held on March 22, 2023. During the court proceedings, it was revealed that Lamar Vickerstaff had confessed on tape to killing Omari Wiggins. He wanted to keep his wife, Ruth, from being charged with anything. They also learned that Ruth had once made a call to Child Protective Services anonymously. Later, she confronted Lamar about how she felt overwhelmed by the child and told him to give Amory to another member of his family. Lamar was looking to strike a deal of some kind with the police by offering these details in exchange for his wife's innocence then Lamar took Omari from Virginia, 
where he was stationed at the time to Opelika and just drove around without giving any further details about how he murdered her. Lamar told the police that he tried resuscitating her. Lamar was held without bond and Ruth had to wear an ankle monitor and stay within Duval County. They will be seeing a grand jury, the date of which will be released by the department later. If convicted, Lamar will be sentenced to life in prison without parole or even the death penalty. While Ruth could face up to 10 years in prison, the police requested people to come forward and provide information in the case of Amory Wiggins, an innocent child who did not live a happy life that was also brutally cut short by her own father. Opelika's baby Jane Doe was officially identified as Amory Jovet Wiggins on January 19, 2023 by teary-eyed officers who had spent years on her case. She would have been 17 years old in 2023. Sherry thought that she was just a year away from meeting her daughter when the police came knocking at her door and informed her that Amori had been dead for over a decade. Sherry organized a memorial for her late daughter in February of 2023. Everyone showed up in pink and red attire honoring her name. Amori, the tearful mother said, she has a name, say it loud, Amori Jovet Wiggins. She read out a poem in the loving memory of her daughter. I wish I could hold your hand and kiss your cheek just to let you know how much you mean to me. Detective Alfred White, who did not give up hope on Amory's case, also attended the services. He gave a heartfelt message to her remembering how much she meant to the Opelika Police Department. Amore, we love you. We do. We all love you, Amore. If you didn't get to hear from the people who had you last, you can hear it from here. We love you. Before we continue, 90% of you haven't subscribed to our channel, so if you like this video, please subscribe. It motivates us to make more content for you. Okay, let's continue. On January 6, 1982, Harold E. Bray, the sheriff of Jefferson County, Colorado, was on a United Airlines flight to San Francisco for business. While looking out the window as the plane flew over the mountains west of Denver, he saw flashes of light three short, three long, then three short again. Recognizing this as an SOS signal, Sheriff Bray realized someone was in distress far below. He quickly alerted the pilot. The pilot relayed the report to the Federal Aviation Administration, which diverted two other planes in the area to investigate. A Rocky Mountain Airlines pilot spotted a truck in the location of the SOS, and the Clear Creek County Sheriff's Office was notified about a motorist stranded on Ganella Pass. Just before midnight, Dave Montoya, a fire chief in Clear Creek County, was sent to the scene. That night, heavy snow was falling, and the temperature at the high altitude was about 20 degrees below zero. Near the top of the pass, Montoya found a pickup truck stuck in a snowdrift, with 30-year-old Alan Lee Phillips still inside the cab. Phillips claimed he had attempted to drive across the more than 11,000-foot mountain pass on his way back to his home in Georgetown from a friend's house in Bailey when his truck became stuck in the snowdrift. He attributed his poor choice to try to make it across the pass in the heavy snow to the fact that he had been drinking earlier. He had been wearing warm clothes and had an emergency blanket in his truck, but he did not have snow chains for his tires. He had tried to walk to a nearby ski area after getting stuck, but it only made it about 200 yards on foot before he realized he would not survive the extreme weather conditions. Desperate, he used his truck's headlights to signal SOS when he heard a plane fly overhead and was extremely lucky that the signal was not only seen, but seen by someone who understood what it meant. Dave Montoya was shocked at the situation, both at Philip's bad idea to try to make it across the pass in the first place under those conditions and the sheer luck of the SOS being seen from the sky and Philip's being saved. We ended up picking up the guy straight out of hell, Dave said decades later. When Dave found Phillips, he had a large bruise on his face. He claimed he had sustained it after getting out of his truck to urinate. He had been blinded by the raging snow and slammed his head into the corner of, of his truck as he tried to get back inside. When Dave got a good look at the man he was rescuing, he recognized him. Dave had seen Phillips at the local mine where he worked as a miner. Phillips was employed there as a mechanic. It would be almost 40 years before Dave would recognize that face again. This time he saw it on television while watching the local news in March of 2021. Phillips' mugshot popped up on the screen. He had been arrested mugshot popped up on the screen. He had been arrested for two cold case murders, both of which he was accused of committing on the same night Dave had rescued him from the Ganella Pass. 
He had not been in the area because of a bad choice he made while driving home from a friend's house. He had instead been there disposing of the body of the second woman he had killed that day. He got his mercy. He got saved. He got his life saved. He didn't die up there. But he did bad things before that. And he's got to pay for them. Dave told the media after learning of Philip's arrest. Annette Schnee graduated from East High School in Sioux City, Iowa in 1978. She attended school in Nebraska before moving out to Colorado. She had a laid-back personality and was a free spirit who had hopes of one day becoming a flight attendant. At the beginning of 1982, 21-year-old Annette was living in the Colorado town of Blue River. She worked two jobs, one at the Holiday Inn in Frisco and the other at the Flipside Bar in Beaver Run. On January 6, 1982, she left work at the Holiday Inn early because she was not feeling well. She went to a nearby medical center in Frisco and then got a ride to a pharmacy on Ski Hill Road in Breckenridge. At the pharmacy, Annette was seen speaking with a woman she appeared to know, although the woman's identity has never been determined. When she finished at the pharmacy, Annette went outside to hitchhike home. Hitchhiking was a common behavior for Annette, as well as for the residents of what was then still the relatively small town of Breckenridge. Annette was last seen at 4.45 p.m., she did not report to or call out of her 8 p.m. shift at the bar that night. Annette was quickly reported missing. Her supervisor at the holiday in filed a report the morning after she was last seen when she did not show up for her shift. However, despite this quick action, it would be nearly six months before there were any answers in her disappearance. On July 3rd, a young boy out on a fishing trip with his father found Annette's body face down in Sacramento Creek in a rural area in Park County, approximately 20 miles away from Breckenridge. Because she had been in cold water, her body was preserved enough for an autopsy to be performed despite the amount of time since her death. But testing to determine if she had been sexually assaulted could not be completed. She had been found fully clothed, but with her clothing in disarray. Annette was not the only woman to vanish from Breckenridge on the night of January 6th. Just a few hours after Annette was last seen, 29-year-old Barbara Jo Oberholzer, who went by Bobby Jo, also vanished from the small mountain town. Bobby Jo was a native of Wisconsin who moved to Colorado with her husband, Jeff Oberholzer, in May of 1980. She was the loving mother of an 11-year-old daughter. Bobby Jo had never hurt anyone in her life according to her sister Lori, and had a kind soul that resonated with both humans and animals. She raised baby birds from the time they hatched until they could fly and was training a previously wild Mustang. She had big dreams and made meticulous plans to achieve them. She carried a notebook with her full of detailed notes and potential budgets for a horse corral she and her husband hoped to construct on their property. Bobby Jo had gone out for drinks with some of her co-workers on the evening of January 6, 1982 to celebrate a promotion she had just received. She had been working as a secretary at a local real estate developer's office and had just been promoted to office manager. The group went to the village pub at the Bell Tower Mall in Breckenridge. Bobby Jo called her husband, Jeff, to tell him she would be going out to celebrate and he had offered to pick her up from the bar. She told him that he didn't have to and that she would hitchhike back to their home in Alma, Colorado. She was an experienced hitchhiker who had her own set of safety rules she followed when she was getting rides, like avoiding vans and never getting into a vehicle with two men. Bobby Joe's co-workers offered to give her a ride home as well, but she wanted to leave her home earlier than any of them did. Bobby Joe was last seen at the bar at 7.50 p.m., just three hours after Annette was last seen. Jeff fell asleep that night but woke up at 11.30 worried that his wife had not arrived home. By 1.30 a.m., he was panicked because he knew the bars were closed and that Bobby Joe still had not gotten home. He drove to Breckenridge and spent the remainder of the night looking for her. By the time the sun rose, Jeff had filed a missing persons report, and he then organized his friends into search parties to look for Bobby Joe. Some of Bobby Joe's Joe. Some of Bobby Joe's possessions were found that morning, but she herself remained missing. A rancher found her driver's license off of Route 285 and Jeff found her backpack not far from that location. Then a more concerning clue was found. Bobby Joe's glove, covered in blood. Around 3 p.m., 
some of Bobby Joe's friends discovered her body on a snow embankment near the summit of Hoosier Pass. This site was just 10 miles away from where Annette's body would eventually be found. Bobby Joe had been shot twice. She had one grazing wound to her breast and had been shot once in the back. It appeared Bobby Joe had managed to get away from her killer, who then shot at her as she ran to escape. Her autopsy found no signs of sexual assault. Annette and Bobby Joe had not known each other, but their cases were quickly linked. This was due in part to the similar circumstances of the cases. Both women had been hitchhiking hitchhiking out of Breckenridge on the same night and taken to isolated areas where they were killed. It was determined that both women had been shot with either a 38 or 357 handgun. The cases were most directly linked, thanks to a more unusual clue, a pair of distinctive orange booties. One of the socks was found on Annette's body, while the other was located at Bobby Joe's crime scene. Authorities believed that the two women's killer must have been a local because of the remote high elevation locations where the bodies were found. As Bobby Joe's husband, Jeff Oberholzer, was immediately looked at as a potential suspect, but he had an alibi, passed a polygraph examination, and was later cleared by what would prove to be the most important clue in the case, DNA. Testing on Bobby Joe's bloody glove initially could only determine the blood type of the blood, and it was the same type Bobby Joe herself had, leading to the assumption that the blood had come from her. Decades later, investigators were able to develop a DNA profile from the glove as well as from a tissue that had been found with it. The profile actually belonged to a man. Decades after Bobby Joe was killed, 11th Judicial District Attorney Linda Stanley would hail her as a fighter and a hero. Because Bobby Joe had been brave enough to fight her killer with enough force to draw his blood, she had provided investigators with the critical DNA evidence. The profile was uploaded to National Database in 2002, but no match was found in the ensuing years. Numerous potential suspects were considered in the case in the decades following Bobby Joe and Annette's murders. Eight or nine men who knew either Annette or Bobby Joe, at least four serial killers and known rapists who operated in the area, were all investigated but eventually ruled out by the DNA evidence. After the case was featured on the television show Unsolved Mysteries, a psychic called in claiming that a man on death row in Idaho was Bobby Joe and Annette's killer, but his DNA was not a match to that from the crime scene either. Investigators Charlie McCormick and Richard Eaton spent decades dedicated to the case. Richard was assigned to the case in 1984 while he was employed as an investigator for the Summit County Sheriff's Office and continued working on it in his free time after he retired 15 years later. Charlie had moved to Breckenridge in 1976 after retiring as a Denver homicide detective because he had grown tired of such investigations and the stress that they caused. In Breckenridge, he became a private investigator, but took an interest in Annette and Bobby Joe's case. Annette's family hired him in 1989 to work as a private investigator on the case, which helped him gain access to law enforcement files related to the investigation. He charged the family $1 per year for all of his work. In 1999, both Charlie and Richard joined the district attorney's task force dedicated to the case, which was later transferred to the jurisdiction of the Park County Sheriff's Office. With no luck finding a match to the DNA from the crime scene, incremental databases, or amongst identified suspects, investigators ultimately turned to the more novel approach of using genetic genealogy to identify the contributor of the DNA. Working with United Data Connect, a Colorado-based genetic genealogy firm co-founded by former prosecutor Mitch Morrissey, investigators identified over 12,000 people who were biologically related to the man whose blood was left on Bobby Joe's glove. Numerous individuals were asked and agreed to provide samples of their DNA to help place the killer in the extensive family tree more accurately. It took over a year's worth of work, but genealogists were able to eventually narrow down the pool of potential suspects and identify Alan Phillips as a likely match to the DNA from the blood on the glove. Investigators surveilled Phillips for several weeks in hopes of surreptitiously collecting a sample of his DNA so they could compare it to the DNA from the crime scene. One day in February of 2021, they witnessed him purchase fast food and take his trash in with him to the post office. He left the post office without the trash, and the investigators collected it from the trash can. DNA was extracted from the saliva on a napkin left with the trash and found to be a match to the DNA from the blood found on Bobby Joe's glove. On February 24, 2021, 
The now 70-year-old Alan Lee Phillips was arrested and charged with two counts each of first-degree kidnapping, first-degree assault, and first-degree murder in connection to Annette and Bobby Joe's murders. He was taken into custody without incident after being arrested during a traffic stop. By this time, he was semi-retired and had three children from a marriage that had ended in divorce. He had remained in the area following Bobby Joe and Annette's murders and was a longtime resident of Dumont, Colorado. Following Philip's arrest, Jeff Oberholzer released a statement that concluded by saying, I cannot thank enough all who never gave up the search for the truth. They are, without doubt, extremely dedicated and extraordinary individuals. Phillips is finally in the hands of the judicial system. May justice be served. Phillips plead not guilty to all of the charges against him, and his trial began on August 29, 2022. On September 15, 2022, after four hours of deliberation, a jury found Phillips guilty of all eight charges he was facing. Phillips' identification and conviction inspired complex emotions for Annette and Bobby Joe's surviving relatives. Annette's older brother, Russell, who attended the trial along with Annette's two sisters, was glad that his mother had lived to see her daughter's killer convicted as she had long feared that she would not be able to do so. He was also grateful to all of the individuals who had spent so much time dedicated to his sister's case and had ultimately identified Phillips. However, he is hesitant to say that Phillips' conviction makes him happy. He had a stone face. He didn't move. No expression. No remorse. That's one of the things I'm not happy about. No details. No motive, Russell said of Phillips' reaction in the courtroom to his conviction. I want to know what fear my sister felt, the pain she felt, and I wish that he would endure that himself. Bobby Joe's sister, Lori, was unable to travel to Colorado for the trial, but stated that the emotion she felt after learning of Phillips' conviction was between relief and satisfaction of finally knowing that he had been convicted on all counts. It was a very emotional thing to hear. Phillips is due in court for his sentencing on November 7, 2022. He faces life in prison. In 1992, the city was rocked by the murder of Annette Stewart, a young woman whose life was cut tragically short. The heinous crime sent shock waves through the community, leaving residents fearful and on edge. Despite exhaustive investigations, the perpetrator remained at large, and the case went cold, haunting the city for over 30 years. Annette Stewart was born in 1963 in Australia to Roy and Margaret Stewart. Growing up, she shared her home with her two sisters, Gillian and Jeanette, who she had a very strong bond with. Their home was full of love and laughter, and their parents adored their three daughters with all their heart. In her late teens, she had her first child, a daughter named Jacinta, who became the apple of her eye. Three years later, she had another child, this time a son who she named Aaron. She raised the two of them as a single mother and worked at the Point Henry Ammunition Factory, which allowed her to provide a good life for both her and her children. The three of them lived together in 1992 in a home on Hope Street in Geelong West. Sadly, this is where the tragedy would occur. On March 18, 1992, a friend entered Annette's home after being unable to get in touch with her. When they heard no response after calling out, they went into Annette's bedroom to see if she was there. What they saw would haunt them forever. They saw Annette's naked body sprawled out in a non-position on the bed, lifeless and certainly dead. In a state of shock, they phoned the police, and the investigation began soon afterwards. As the investigation into Annette Stewart's death began, it was discovered that the 29-year-old had left work at Point Henry around 4.30 p.m., the day before her lifeless body was found in her home. There was also foreign DNA found at the crime scene, though its nature was never specified. As the investigators delved deeper, they turned to Annette's family and friends for answers. It was during these interviews that they uncovered a startling fact Annette had shared a meal with four friends at her home the night before her body was found the revelation sent shock waves through the community how could four people have been in her home just hours before she died? and yet no one had noticed anything amiss? The truth about Annette Stewart's death was finally revealed after an autopsy was conducted. She had been strangled to death, and the case was ruled a homicide. Annette Stewart's tragic death not only left her friends and family devastated, but it also had a profound impact on her two children, Jacinta and Aaron. 
Jacinta was 13 years old at the time of her mother's death, and her brother Aaron was only 10. Despite the best efforts of the investigators working on Annette's case, the truth remained elusive. As time passed, leads dried up and the trail grew colder. The case became one of many in the growing list of unsolved mysteries. In 2007, a tragic and disturbing event unfolded within the murder case of Annette. Investigators worked tirelessly to uncover the truth, and their efforts led a coroner to pinpoint a co-worker as the primary suspect. Annette was a valued employee at the Point Henry Ammunition Factory. Despite this lead, justice was never fully served, as no charges were ultimately pressed. In 2015, a glimmer of hope emerged in this long-standing quest for justice, in the case of Annette's murder. In an effort to encourage those with information to come forward, the Victoria Police offered a reward of a staggering $1 million. Annette's children also made a heartfelt plea to the public, imploring anyone with information about their mother's death to step forward. Darren John Chalmers, a 54-year-old man from Western Australia, was charged on March 14, 2023, with the 1992 murder of Annette Stewart in Geelong, Victoria. According to reports, Chalmers had been a person of interest in the case for some time and, in 2019, police obtained a DNA sample from him that matched the DNA found at the crime scene. This breakthrough led to Chalmers' arrest and extradition from Western Australia to Victoria to face charges. Chalmers is a former truck driver who had lived in the Geelong area at the time of Stewart's murder. He had no previous criminal record and was not known to Stewart. His arrest came as a shock to those who knew him, with some describing him as a quiet and unassuming man. The news of the arrest brought renewed attention to this case and a renewed sense of hope that justice would finally be served. Following his extradition to Victoria, the man was remanded in custody until his appearance in the Melbourne Magistrates Court on March 20, 2023. He made a virtual appearance in Melbourne Magistrates Court wearing glasses and lush green fields could be seen in the background as he connected to the courtroom via video link from Jail Chalmers has been ordered to remain in custody, and his next court appearance is scheduled for June 2023. In the event that Chalmers is found guilty of Annette Stewart's murder, he could be facing facing a lifetime in prison. Although it may not bring Annette back, it would at least provide a sense of closure for her family and friends, who have suffered her loss and waited for so long to see justice served. 57-year-old Sarah Roberts and her 26-year-old daughter, Sharon Roberts, were discovered dead in their apartment on February 20, 1994. The murderer remained a mystery for 29 years until 2023. Sarah Roberts lived with her daughter, Sharon Roberts, at West 125th Street in Harlem, away from the rest of their family. A caregiver named Celeste Cornelius was appointed to provide support for both of them, as Sarah suffered from severe emphysema and Sharon had a mental disability. Therefore, both Sarah and Sharon relied on Celeste for many things. It was February 20, 1994, when Celeste reached their sixth floor apartment to find that the door was unlocked. With previous incidences of robbery in the complex, it was a matter of worry to her. As she went inside, she heard no sound, none at all. That's when Celeste rushed to the bedroom and found Sarah lying on the bed dead. She rushed in to check on Sharon in terror. Sharon too was laid out on the floor with a pair of woolen leggings around her neck. Both the women were dead. The sight horrified Celeste who went to the neighbors for help and called 911. The police arrived at the scene at 10.15 p.m. and noticed the following things. There were no signs of forced entry, meaning that the killer was likely a familiar face, and the place was raided in such a way that the killer knew where the most precious items would be, meaning the killer had been in the apartment before. And lastly, both the women seemed ill and weak, meaning they could not have defended themselves. Now the officers relied on Celeste, who had found the bodies for more information. She told them that she had been providing care for both of the women who had been slain. She told the detectives that she spoke to Sarah the previous night around 8 p.m. Later, she tried contacting them, but did not get a response. She tried again the next morning and around noon but could not reach them. This was when she became worried and decided to check on them herself. What she found would turn out to be a 29-year-old long mystery. When the autopsy report came back, it revealed that they were both strangled to death using the tube from Sarah's oxygen tank. 
The cause of death was ruled as asphyxia. Hoping to find the killer, the police collected all the evidence available at the time at the crime scene, including some cigarette butts, which could not have been in their apartment if the killer had not left them. Because of Sarah and Sharon's medical condition, it was highly unlikely for the police to find cigarettes at their place. They collected a dry secretion swab from Sharon's hand. Along with this, they collected nail clippings from both the victims to extract any possible DNA that might belong to the murderer. As the police found the place to be completely ransacked with no sign of forced entry, their main suspect would be someone who Sarah and Sharon were familiar with. The neighbors, frequent visitors, and Sarah's acquaintances were all questioned. The detectives talked to a neighbor who did not want to be named. She said that someone broke into Sarah and Sharon's apartment a week before Christmas and took away $100 and a VHS cassette player with tapes. After this, Sarah installed a third lock in her apartment. The neighbor also referred to Sarah as very sickly, as she had oxygen tanks delivered to her place quite often, which were sometimes mistakenly sent to the neighbor's house. In fact, she needed support from her caretaker, who used to hold Sarah's hand to help her walk and get around. The police suspected that the murders were linked to the robbery. They thought that the previous robbery in the apartment could have given a strong motive to the robber to return and strike again. An intensive investigation followed, but all efforts fell short. Even the DNA evidence did not show any results in the database, so the case eventually turned cold. The year 2022 provided a major breakthrough in the murder case of Sarah and Sharon. Technology had evolved, and it gave the police the capability to solve a crime and catch the culprit, and that is what they did. When the crime site DNA was run through the national database again, it showed a perfect match to a 64-year-old man, Larry Atkinson, a man who lived in Harlem, just 13 blocks away from the site of the murders. When the officers from the NYPD Bronx Cold Case Squad reached his residence to arrest him on the morning of January 23, 2023, they found that he had been staying with his long-term partner, Celeste Cornelius, none other than the caretaker of Sarah and Sharon. They had been dating in 1984 when the murders happened, but neither Celeste nor Larry had been regarded as potential suspects in the original investigation. The story was not over yet. When Larry's background was checked, the police found that he was a convicted felon who had been in and out of jail since 1985 for several offenses. He had around 13 arrests and five convictions under his name for attempted robbery, drug use and sale, and assault he served time under different aliases he was in jail for two years due to a drug offense case and received parole in 2013. It was during his last arrest that his DNA was submitted to the national database. The police had found the killer of two innocent, harmless, vulnerable women who died terribly. Larry Atkinson was being taken to the police station when he informed the detectives that he was not feeling well. Larry had been diagnosed with cancer. He was taken to the hospital and then to the police station in a wheelchair with an oxygen mask, however, do it. She was informed. Celeste, his partner, insisted that he didn't about the DNA match but she did not believe that Larry could have killed Sarah and her daughter. She said, I don't want you to misquote me, but I know he didn't do it. I don't care about the DNA. None of that mess. He didn't do it. Celeste and Larry's neighbor, Juliet Wilson, said that the couple had been living together for about 20 years without fighting at all. She seemed to believe that Larry was a nice guy. The news of his arrest came as a shock to her but the police maintained their stance and believed that Larry was a cold-blooded killer. Although they could not narrow down the motive or if he was let in the apartment, Larry was tried. He tried defending himself by claiming, you got the wrong person in jail. I'm not guilty. But on January 27, 2023, Manhattan Supreme Court Judge, Alethea Drysdale, charged him with the murders of Sarah and Sharon without offering bail. Although the killer is behind bars, under medical supervision, the case remains open for further investigation. Mary Lucille Wilfong, a mother of three, was residing in Gainesville, Georgia in 1989. She was known to enjoy life and take one day at a time. She liked hitchhiking and more often than not, she rode with truck drivers. Her mother described her as a base hopper because Mary liked military bases and military men. She lived a free and carefree lifestyle, but did not know what awaited her. On November 21, 1989, 
the Monroe County Sheriff's Office received a call from a group of deer hunters after they had discovered a body in a wooded area off the Johnstonville Road off the I-75, which was just about 50 miles south of Atlanta. When the police reached the location, they were able to identify the victim as a 23-year-old missing woman, Mary Lucille Wilfong, who had been reported missing on November 19, 1989. The case was deeply complex, as the woman had already been missing from a truck shop for over two days. Then her dead body was found in the woods, in a spine-chilling state. The autopsy revealed that she had been sexually assaulted, then strangled. It was unimaginable what harrowing events she witnessed and faced in her last moments. Therefore, the police were determined to find the killer. They set out to find any witnesses who might have seen Mary. Luckily, the police were able to receive some useful tips. There were some witnesses who had seen her at a farmer's market in Forest Park, 47 miles away in the southern region of Atlanta. The deputies found out that she had been seen entering a tractor trailer with an unidentified white man. The police searched and searched to find a suspect. They collected DNA evidence from Mary's body, but it showed no match for the possible suspects. So despite all their efforts in the investigation, in the end, the police had no leads about who could have murdered her. Ultimately, the case went cold. But all hope was not lost, as Monroe County Sheriff Freeman assigned the case to the investigator Mark Mansfield on March 11, 2019. He was instructed to reopen the case. New technology enabled the investigators to re-examine the initial evidence. Mark submitted the evidence to the GBI crime lab, the same evidence that was also sent to the DNA International, a company based in Miami, Florida, so that they could zero in on the correct suspect. Mansfield got in touch with Special Agent Tim Burke of the FBI Atlanta team to collaborate on the case. After more than three decades in early 2023, the police found a match using genetic genealogy. Larry Paget, a 59-year-old man residing in Lugatee, Indiana was identified as a suspect. He would have been around 25 years of age when he committed the crime, and he, in fact, used to drive tractor trailers at the time of the murder of Mary Lucille Wilfong. So finally, an arrest warrant was issued. Then on March 1, 2023, Mark Mansfield and a local Indiana law enforcement officer, Sergeant Kimmon Colvard, drove up to Washington, Indiana to find justice for Mary. They arrested Larry Paget for the murder and sexual assault of Mary Wilfong. More evidence was collected by the FBI Evidence Recovery Team and Washington PD GBI Crime Lab retrieved the DNA proof and confirmed the match, which revealed additional evidence linking Larry to the murder. Larry is being detained in Indiana until the waiver of extradition can be signed, which will bring him back to Georgia for further procedures. Larry probably thought that he would never be apprehended and that he had gotten away with murder for more than 30 years. It definitely took time, but justice was finally served for Mary. On May 14, 1961, U.S. Air Force Sergeant and Vietnam War veteran, James C. Turachak, welcomed his first child into the world, a beautiful girl named Terry Turachak. A few years later, he had a son, who he named James Jr. Terry and her younger brother shared a happy childhood and were practically inseparable. When they grew up and began their own families, Terry had three lovely children of her own. But neither their names nor the identity of their father is known. Her brother James remembers her as being a great mom to the kids. Terry was 35 years old and residing at 1927 East 17th Avenue in Denver in 1996. Terry was in a relationship with an unidentified man but was also known to have other relationships on the side Terry's life was going good. But she had no idea what fate had in store for her in the near future October 15, 1996 was a sleepy Saturday in Denver, Colorado. The previous night, Terry had planned a fun Friday out with her friends. As her kids were away and she had a rare night out for herself, she had gotten done with work and then got home and got ready for her night out and left her house around 8 p.m. The next morning, Terry's apartment door lay suspiciously open, but it was only after midday at 12.40 p.m. that a neighbor had noticed this and went to see if everything was all right inside. When they called out and got no response, they slowly approached the bedroom. When they entered the room, they were shocked to find Terry laying face down on the floor. When Terry did not respond after being shaken, 
they rushed outside and dialed 911 to report that she was dead. Homicide detectives Joe Tennant and Joe Dermott from the Denver Police Department took the lead on the case. In the bedroom, where Terry's body was discovered, they discovered evidence of a struggle. They also gathered from the neighbors that between 1 and 1.30 a.m. that day, there had been some sort of commotion in Terry's flat. The flat showed no indications of being broken into, and it appeared as though the murderer had simply strolled out and left the door open as they were leaving. They discovered that no one had seen someone leave around that time when they asked the other residents. Medical examiner Dr. T. Henry later performed an autopsy on the body. He had discovered that Terry had been strangled and that she had also suffered blunt force trauma to her head and face. He recovered hair from her right thigh, which detectives believed came from the killer. He also found evidence that she had been sexually assaulted prior to her death. The case was ruled a homicide, and an investigation began to catch the killer in order to learn more about Terry's whereabouts, as well as to determine whether anyone in the building had seen or heard anything strange. The investigators spoke with her friends, relatives, and neighbors. They discovered a number of odd facts regarding Terry's last night alive. Around 11.30 p.m., a neighbor had seen Terry entering the building, and she had not been alone, but was with an African-American male. Another neighbor reported that around 12.30 a.m., they had heard a disturbance and shouting coming from Terry's flat. Another neighbor reported that Terry knocked on her door at 1 a.m. to ask for money and, at the time, Terry seemed to be injured. When he left to pick up his girlfriend at 3.30 a.m., the neighbor who had heard the noise coming from her home also noticed that her apartment door was left open. Detectives believe Terry was killed at approximately 1.30 a.m. based on these reports. They also spoke to Terry's boyfriend, whose name was not released to the public. He told them that on the night of her death, he had been staying at his mother's house. He also told them that a week before her death, there had been an armed robbery by three men that had taken place inside Terry's home. The detectives now had a number of leads to follow, and they were especially interested in the man who had accompanied Terry home the night that she had died. However, even though they followed all these leads to the best of their abilities, they eventually led nowhere and the case went cold. In August 2004, eight years after the murder, the case was reopened when suddenly there was a match within the COITA system for the foreign DNA that had been removed from the crime scene. The match was for a criminal named Ricky Dawson, who was already serving a 25-year sentence for a second-degree murder charge at the time. When police looked to see if he had been mentioned during the original investigation, he was nowhere to be found. But he did match the description of the man who Terry's neighbors had seen with her the night she died. Detectives then went to interview him at the Sewanee Correctional Institution in Florida, where he was serving his sentence. The exact contents of the interview between the detectives and Dawson have not been released to the public, but after the interview, police conducted one final DNA test by testing new samples of DNA they had taken from Dawson against the hair they had recovered on Terry's body, and it matched the hair's major DNA profile. Satisfied with this, police could have now charged Dawson with Terry's murder. But for whatever reason, perhaps because Dawson still had two decades left on his sentence, this was not done and the case remained dormant for over another decade. Detective John McGrail of the Denver Police Cold Case Unit was given the file for a follow-up investigation 14 years later, a total of 22 long years after Terry's murder. He looked over the case file and discovered that it was basically an open and shut case. He subsequently filed for additional laboratory evaluation on the case in December 2018 in light of the evidence found at the scene and the victim's post-mortem assessment. The DNA once more revealed a conclusive match to Ricky Dawson in August 2019. Ultimately, on January 26, 2023, a warrant for Ricky Dawson's arrest was issued on the accusation of first-degree murder. He was 62 years old and still incarcerated in Florida on a charge of second-degree murder. The Denver Police Department extradited him from Florida to Denver, where he was informed of the charges against him on February 23rd. He is widely expected to be found guilty once the case goes to trial. Denver, Colorado, a vibrant city nestled in the heart of the Rocky Mountains, is known for its breathtaking scenery, rich history, and diverse culture making it a popular destination for both tourists and locals. However, the city's peaceful image was shattered on August 15, 2015, 
with the murder of 61-year-old Jose Frias Olivias. For years, the case remained unsolved, leaving his family and friends without closure. Recently, however, a breakthrough occurred when a suspected Denver gang member accepted a plea deal in connection with the crime. The details of the case are disturbing. On August 28, 2015, Jose Frias Olivias was discovered dead at the intersection of South Federal Boulevard and West Vassar Avenue in Denver. He had been shot in the back of the head, and the motive for the killing was unclear at the time. Described as a kind, caring individual who was always willing to help others, his murder left his family heartbroken and searching for answers. On August 15, 2015, Jose Frias Olivias was visiting his daughter. It was a beautiful morning in Denver, and Jose decided to take a leisurely walk in the park and left his daughter's home, supposed to be a peaceful stroll. Turned into a nightmare when he was shot while walking through Harvard Gulch Park in broad daylight, close to Federal Boulevard. On that fateful day, the police rushed to the intersection of South Federal Boulevard and West Vassar Avenue at 10.30 a.m., following reports of a shooting. To their horror, they discovered Frias Olivia lying face down with a fatal gunshot wound to the back of his head. Despite their best efforts, he was declared dead at the scene, leaving everyone reeling from the tragedy. Jose Frias Olivias was an ordinary person, a retiree who enjoyed taking walks in the park and spending time with his loved ones. But on that fateful day, he became a victim of senseless violence, a tragedy that shook his family and the community to their core. His murder was not only shocking, but also incomprehensible. How could someone so harmless and unassuming fall victim to such a heinous crime, and in broad daylight, and in public of all places? The killing of Frias, who was unarmed and alone at the time, left many people perplexed and questioning why anyone would choose to take the life of an innocent individual. The community and his family were deeply shocked by his tragic and unexpected demise. No one could have imagined that a simple stroll in the park would lead to such a horrific and fatal outcome. Denver has a diverse culture with Western Hispanic and Native American influences, known for its vibrant arts, music, and outdoor recreational opportunities. The community is resilient and determined, but this act of violence served as a reminder to stay vigilant, despite low crime rates in safe neighborhoods. The murder of Jose Frias Olivias was an unexpected and tragic event that shook the Denver community to its core. The killer left no clear motive and seemingly disappeared without a trace. Following the initial investigation, the Denver Police Crime Scene Unit conducted a thorough search of the area. It was during this search that they discovered a single Remington 22 caliber cartridge case on the trail located just east of Frias Olivia's lifeless body. This crucial piece of evidence gave investigators a vital lead to pursue in their efforts to track down those responsible for the tragedy eyewitness accounts also shed some light on the shocking incident several people reported hearing two to three gunshots and saw multiple individuals fleeing the area in panic shortly after the shots rang out. One of the witnesses reported a peculiar detail that could prove to be a vital clue in the investigation. They described one of the suspects as having tattoos on his face, including one over his eye, that resembled the claw marks featured on Monster Energy drinks. This particular detail can narrow down the proof of potential suspects and bring investigators one step closer to justice for the tragic death of Frias Olivia. Furthermore, detectives made a significant breakthrough in the case after discovering a Ruger handgun and a seized Acura. Ballistic tests confirmed that the 22 casing found at the crime scene matched the gun. The discovery that the gun had been reported stolen added weight to the evidence against the suspects. The investigation also uncovered DNA evidence from the murder weapons magazine, providing another crucial piece of evidence in the case. And it was in September 2016 that detectives discovered DNA from the murder weapons magazine matched a profile present in Coitus, the combined DNA index system database, and identified them as the homicide suspect. It was matched with a man named Nicholas Lugian. Despite detectives noticing Nicholas Lugian's distinctive claw mark tattoo on his face, when he was arrested for robbery in October 2015, witnesses were hesitant to cooperate with the investigation. They identified Nicholas as a member of the notorious GKI street gang who went by the moniker Caesar, according to the affidavit. This highlights the fear and reluctance of witnesses to come forward, especially when the suspect is associated with a violent gang. 
the lack of cooperation made it harder for the police to solve the case and bring justice to the victim and their family. Due to the fear of retaliation from the alleged killer and his associates, witnesses were reluctant to come forward and identify the suspect. This lack of cooperation from the witnesses caused the case to go cold, with little progress made in the investigation. Years after Freya's death, the tit that came in via Crime Stoppers in 2017 was a significant breakthrough in the Frias Olivia's murder case. The informant provided detailed information about Lujan's alleged confession, stating that he had bragged about the murder and how he had gotten away with it. This new information gave investigators a critical lead to pursue and provide them with a valuable starting point for their investigation. With this new lead, investigators were able to focus their efforts on building a stronger case against Nicholas. They conducted further interviews, reviewed evidence, and followed up on leads. In 2018, investigators made significant progress in the case by obtaining a DNA sample from Lujan, while he was serving time for a robbery conviction at the Lamone Correctional Facility, matched the DNA found in the Ruger magazine, providing strong evidence linking Nicholas to the crime. Additionally, a witness was able to identify Nicholas from a photo lineup. As one of the individuals seen fleeing the scene of the crime on the day of the shooting, these developments were crucial in building a case against Nicholas, according to the affidavit. One of the suspects in the group later revealed to detectives that Nicholas had fled to a nearby apartment and cleaned his hands with bleach after the incident, and also cleaned the gun. However, the magazine was overlooked, and it was only later discovered to have Nicholas's DNA on it. This evidence further strengthened the case against Nicholas and helped investigators build a solid case for his prosecution. The discovery of this vital piece of evidence would ultimately lead to Lujan's arrest in 2021 and finally, on March 10, 2023, Nicholas pleaded guilty to one count of second-degree murder according to a news release from the Denver's District Attorney Office. He is scheduled to be sentenced on June 9, 2023. Denver District Attorney, Beth McCann, expressed her pride in the work of the Cold Case Unit and the Denver Police Department in a news release regarding their efforts in bringing justice to Mr. Frias Olivius. McCann acknowledged the heinous nature of the murder and recognized the dedication and persistence of law enforcement in solving the case. In the case of Jose Frias Olivius, the Denver Police Department and the Cold Case Unit worked tirelessly to bring justice to his family and loved ones, and we hope that they have received some form of closure. On May 21, 2003, Kathleen Fulbig was convicted of three counts of murder, one count of manslaughter and one count of maliciously inflicting grievous bodily harm. The four victims were her own children, all of whom had died before their second birthday. She was convicted of murder in the deaths of her son Patrick and her daughters Sarah and Laura and of manslaughter in the death of her oldest son Caleb. Following her conviction, she was named Australia's worst female serial killer in the media and considered to be the country's most hated woman. Prosecutors at Kathleen's trial argued that she had smothered all four of her children, despite the absence of any forensic evidence supporting this scenario. Valbig has always maintained that she did not kill her children. In the years following Kathleen's conviction, advances in genetics have provided stronger and stronger evidence that her children's deaths may have had medical rather than criminal causes. Currently, courts in New South Wales are facing the question, were the lives of Kathleen Fulbig's children taken by her own hand, or were the children's deaths and her subsequent convictions for hand, or were the children's deaths and her subsequent convictions for killing them just part of the series of tragedies in her life, which had long been marred by heartache and hardship? Kathleen was born on June 14, 1967 to Kathleen Donovan and Thomas Britton. Her life was difficult and unstable from the start. Both of her parents liked to drink, and her father had violent tendencies. Her mother left home one day after a particularly bad argument with Thomas, leaving their daughter with him. A few weeks later, on January 8, 1969, a drunken Thomas encountered his wife on the street and angrily demanded that she return home. She refused. Thomas then stabbed the elder Kathleen 24 times with a 10 inches knife. He held her in his arms and kissed her face while waiting for authorities to arrive. Kathleen did not survive her injuries and Thomas was sentenced to 15 years in prison. He was subsequently deported to England. Baby Kathleen was just 18 months old at the time of her mother's death. She was at first taken in by her mother's sister and her husband 
but they quickly reported behavioral problems in the little girl. She was reportedly aggressive, preoccupied with her genitals, and uninterested in learning hygiene or proper manners. A medical officer who assessed her at a child health center found that Kathleen had likely been abused by her father since infancy. Kathleen's behavior put strain on her aunt's marriage and the aunt told authorities in June of 1970 that she could no longer provide care for the child. During a psychological and education assessment after she was removed from her aunt's home, Kathleen was described as a very disturbed little girl and found to have an IQ of just 77. Kathleen was placed in a foster home in the town of Newcastle and the new environment seemed to help with her behavior and development. By the time she reached grade two, her IQ was measured at 1100 and she demonstrated good behavior and attendance at school. Behavioral problems would still arise over the years, with Kathleen being described as inattentive, disruptive and defiant in grade five. Kathleen left school according to Kathleen. This resulted from ongoing issues they had. She has described her foster mother as unpredictable and controlling, which resulted in Kathleen never having many friends and being physically disciplined when she did not meet her foster mother's strict standards for her numerous household chores. Kathleen left home when she left school and moved in with a friend. One weekend soon after, she met the man who would become her husband while out dancing at a nightclub. Craig Falbig was six years Kathleen senior and worked as a forklift operator. Kathleen immediately found him charming and viewed him as a knight in shining armor who could give her support and love in her largely chaotic life. Kathleen married Craig in 1987 at the age of 18. Both Kathleen and Craig looked forward to having a family as an obvious next step. Craig came from a family of eight children and was still processing the death of his own mother, who had died when he was just 15, and Kathleen had lacked a stable family life of her own growing up, so having children was important to both of them for their own reasons. When Kathleen became pregnant for the first time, she was very protective of her unborn child. She made improvements to her diet and made her husband go outside to smoke so that she would not be breathing in so much of the secondhand smoke. Kathleen had an easy pregnancy but a difficult delivery, which required the use of forceps. She was unable to hold her baby for a few hours but stated that she felt complete with her husband and her child as soon as she did get to hold him. Caleb Gibson Fulbeg was born on February 1, 1989. He was full term and born at a healthy weight. Kathleen woke up around 1 a.m. on February 20th to feed Caleb and then went back to bed. When she woke up to use the bathroom two hours later, she went in to check on the baby while she was awake. She found that he wasn't breathing. She screamed for her husband and Craig performed CPR on Caleb while Kathleen called an ambulance. Paramedics were unable to resuscitate the baby. Caleb was just 19 days old when he passed away. His cause of death was found to be sudden infant death syndrome or SIDS. Kathleen and Craig were devastated by their son's death, but decided to try for another baby towards the end of 1989. Kathleen soon became pregnant. Her second pregnancy was obviously far more stressful and Kathleen and Craig purchased all new bedding and made home improvements they believed would reduce the risk of SIDS for their second child. Patrick Allen Fulbig was born on June 3, 1990. In light of his brother's death, he underwent a variety of tests when he was a week and a half old, including a sleep study, an ECG, and a barium test to check for reflux, all of which had normal results. On October 18, 1990, when he was four and a half months old, Patrick experienced what medical experts classified as an apparent life-threatening event. Patrick had been coughing, so Kathleen went to comfort him, and he went back to sleep. When she went to check on him at 4.30 a.m., Patrick was not breathing and had turned blue. He was rushed to the hospital and resuscitated. However, the brain damage the incident caused left him partially blind and suffering from seizures, which meant that he required constant supervision. Kathleen had planned to go back to work, but Craig took on a more demanding job so that she could stay home and provide Patrick with the constant care he now required. Patrick was taken to the hospital four more times in November-December of 1990 after suffering subsequent seizures. Patrick passed away on February 13, 1991, while Craig was at work. His cause of death was found to be due to airway obstruction as a result of a seizure. Kathleen became depressed and preoccupied with what external factors she had failed to address that could have saved Patrick. She and Craig coped by making several major life changes, 
including selling the house where both their sons had died, moving to a new town, and starting new jobs. Kathleen became pregnant again and fixated on limiting her food intake and becoming as physically fit as possible for her baby. Sarah Kathleen Fulbig was born on October 14, 1993, and had a normal sleep study at three weeks old. Kathleen and Craig put her crib in their bedroom so that they could keep a closer eye on her as she slept. Tragically, Sarah still passed away on August 30, 1991, at 10 and a half months old. During one of her checks on Sarah, Kathleen had found her blue and not breathing. Sarah's death certificate listed her cause of death as SIDS. While the death of each of their children had left both Kathleen and Craig understandably depressed, following Sarah's death, their relationship almost fell apart due to each other's poor mental states. They again sold their house and moved, this time to be closer to Craig's family. Kathleen put on weight, but then feared that this would push away her husband. She returned to obsessively tracking her diet and working out at the gym. Kathleen and Craig did separate on several occasions, but only for brief periods of time. Kathleen felt her relationship with Craig hit rock bottom during this period, but the couple was able to rebuild their marriage. Eventually, Kathleen became pregnant with her fourth child and again fixated on exercising so as to be as healthy as possible for the baby. Laura Elizabeth Fulbig was born on August 7, 1997, and soon underwent extensive medical examinations. A sleep study found that while she did not have obstructive sleep apnea, she did have mild central apnea, although this would resolve itself by the time she was six months old. Biochemical, metabolic, and blood tests all came back normal. She was sent home with a cardiorespiratory monitoring device to record and download information about her breathing and her heart rate while she slept. The device would set off alarm if it detected any decrease in either. The machine reassured Craig but made Kathleen anxious because of its frequent false alarms. Laura was no longer prescribed to use the device after she turned a year old. Kathleen and Craig were understandably terrified of losing Laura like they had her siblings during the first year of her life. So when they were finally able to throw a birthday party for one of their children, they held a big celebration to mark Laura's birthday. While Laura lived longer than her siblings, she also ultimately died suddenly. She passed away on March 1, 1999 after Kathleen put her down for a morning nap when she was just shy of 19 months old. Her autopsy found that she had myocarditis or an inflammation in her heart muscle, while all three professors of forensic pathology called at a later inquiry, stated that they would have listed Laura's cause of death as myocarditis because of how extensive it was. The forensic pathologist who performed the autopsy listed the cause of death as undetermined. They noted in their report that the family history of no living children, following for live births, is highly unusual. The possibility of multiple homicides this family has not been excluded. The death of a fourth child in one family also caught the attention of the local police, and a detective was assigned to investigate Laura's death on the day it occurred. Following Laura's death, the Fulbeg's marriage finally collapsed under the weight of their grief. They went to counseling, but Kathleen moved out of their shared home in April of 1999. She had moved back in by that June, but she and Craig were separated for good by June of 2000. It was during the first period of separation following Laura's death that Craig became suspicious that his children's deaths may have been caused by his wife rather than by natural causes. While cleaning up his wife's belongings in May of 1999, he came across a diary she had written between June of 1996, June of 1997. He began reading it and was concerned by some of its passages. In October of 1996, shortly before she came pregnant with Laura, she wrote, obviously, I'm my father's daughter, while discussing making mistakes in her past. Since Kathleen's father was a murderer, Craig was alarmed that his wife seemed to relate to him. In another entry, she wrote, my guilt of how responsible I feel for them all haunts me. My fear of it happening again haunts me. What scares me most will be when I'm alone with the baby. How do I overcome that? Defeat that? Craig took the diary to the police and was interviewed. During this interview, he said that he was suspicious that Kathleen had been involved in their children's deaths. He was asked to return for a second interview four days later. During the time in between these two meetings with police, Craig went to see his estranged wife and accused her of killing the children. Kathleen was appalled and slammed the door in his face. 
She later returned to the home she had once shared with Craig to yell at him, telling him that he knew how much she loved their children and that he needed to tell the police the truth. Craig recanted his earlier statement when he met with police again, and he and Kathleen temporarily reconciled a short time later. Kathleen was interviewed about the diary for eight hours one day that July. She stated that she felt like she was her father's daughter, not because they were both murderers, but because she viewed him as a loser in general and felt like she was a loser as well. She felt guilt over the deaths of her children, not because she was their killer, but because she was their mother, and she had failed to protect them from whatever it was that kept taking them from her. Authorities remained focused on Kathleen's diaries and asked her if she had any more. She turned over one she had just purchased, which she said was the only one she had. However, after investigators obtained a search warrant and searched her home, they found another diary, written between June of 1997 April of 1998, in a bag inside of a case in the wardrobe in her bedroom. Kathleen claimed that she had not tried to hide the diary from police. She had just forgotten that she still had it. Police would eventually come into possession of six of Kathleen's diaries, with five other diaries from the period of time her children died, believed to be unaccounted for. These diaries would play a major role in the criminal proceedings that would eventually be held in connection to the deaths of the Fulbeck children. On April 19, 2001, Kathleen was arrested and charged with the murder of all four of her children. When Kathleen went to trial in 2003, her diaries were a major part of the prosecution's largely circumstantial case. The prosecution claimed that certain passages all but admitted her guilt. I feel like the worst mother on this earth, scared that Laura will leave me now, like Sarah did. I knew I was short-tempered and cruel sometimes to her and she left. With a bit of help, Volbig wrote in one entry, can't happen again. I'm ashamed of myself. I can't tell my husband about it because he'll worry about leaving her with me. The defense claimed that the passages were merely expressions of Kathleen's understandable feelings of maternal guilt and over-examination of everything she did in an effort to understand why her children kept passing away. The prosecution argued at trial that Kathleen had smothered all four of her children. However, there was no forensic evidence that the children had been smothered. Smothering sometimes leaves behind physical signs, but in some cases, it does not. Laura's death was slightly more difficult to attribute to smothering simply because of her age. At almost 19 months old, when she died, she would have been physically strong enough to struggle against being smothered, which can result in certain characteristic injuries which she did not have. Furthermore, there were other known health factors that could have contributed to the children's deaths. Caleb had been diagnosed with a floppy larynx, which can make it difficult for an infant to breathe. The seizures Patrick experienced were severe enough that they could have resulted in his death. In this case, the charge against Kathleen for maliciously inflicting grievous bodily harm alleged that she had tried and failed to smother him on the occasion of his first life-threatening event, which resulted in the brain damage that led to the seizures. If Laura had not been the fourth of her parents' children to die, her death would almost certainly have been attributed to the myocarditis found during her autopsy. However, at the time, there was no such known alternative explanation for Sarah's death. While the maxim was not explicitly invoked during the trial, the prosecution's case appeared to be highly influenced by what came to be known as Meadows' Law, which states that one sudden infant death is a tragedy, two is suspicious, and three is murder until proved otherwise. This saying originated from Roy Meadow, a British pediatrician who coined the phrase Munchausen syndrome by proxy to describe what is now also referred to as factitious disorder imposed on another, in which a caregiver either harms or creates the illusion of an illness in another person as an act of attention-seeking behavior. Meadow spent years collecting 1,000 of pounds of taxpayer money per trial, testifying against mothers accused of killing their young children, whose deaths also could have been attributed to SIDS. One of those women was Sally Clark, who was accused of murdering her two sons both of whom had died suddenly. Meadow claimed that the odds of two children dying in a home such as Miss Clark's were one in 73 million, a figure which had absolutely no statistical merit. The actual odds were later calculated to be one in 77. Miss Clark was sentenced to life in prison in 1999, but her conviction was overturned in 2003 in light of Meadow's misleading testimony and the fact that a home office pathologist had failed to disclose that microbiology tests had indicated that at least one of her sons could have died as a result of natural causes. 
She never recovered from the trauma of losing her sons, being accused and convicted of their alleged murder, and being the target of abuse in prison because she was viewed as a baby killer. She died in 2007 of acute alcohol poisoning. At least two more convictions that relied on Meadow's testimony have also been overturned. The General Medical Council struck Meadow off of the medical register in 2005 after finding him guilty of serious professional misconduct for providing erroneous and misleading testimony in court. A high court judge overturned that ruling the following year. During Kathleen's trial, the case against her relied heavily on the premise put forth by Meadow that multiple deaths within one family have to be criminal. The prosecution argued that it was not obligated to prove that the children had been smothered or be able to disprove that they could have died of natural causes. I can't disprove that one day some piglets might be born with wings and that they might fly. Is that some reasonable doubt? No. Is the hypothesis that the defense advances a reasonable doubt? No. Why not? Because if you look at what they are suggesting, not in isolation but in totality, there has never ever been before in the history of medicine that our experts have been able to find any case like this. It is preposterous. It is not a reasonable doubt. It is a fantasy. And, of course, the Crown does not have to disprove a fanciful idea, the prosecutor said during closing statements. The jury found this argument compelling. After almost nine hours of deliberation, they returned a verdict of guilty. Kathleen collapsed in the courtroom when the verdict was read. She was sentenced to 40 years in prison with a non-parole period of 30 years. Kathleen was sent to a maximum security prison where she spent 22 hours a day alone in her cell to prevent other inmates from attacking her and because she was considered high risk for harming herself. Over the following few years, she unsuccessfully ran through all of her rights to appeal her conviction. Her sentence was reduced during this process down to 30 years in prison with a non-parole period of 25 years. Her only remaining hope of proving her innocence and having her conviction overturned was directly petitioning to the New South Wales Attorney General in hopes of having an official inquiry opened into the case. In the years following Kathleen's conviction, the problems with Meadows' law became increasingly evident and more research was carried out about the causes of sudden infant death syndrome. It should be noted that SIDS is a blanket term describing death in infants with no identifiable cause. Despite ongoing research, we do not fully understand what leads to the majority of these deaths. Parents are advised of certain preventative measures they can take, largely involving an infant's sleeping environment, but these only reduce the risk of a child dying from SIDS, not eliminate it. Furthermore, there is increasing evidence that deaths from SIDS have a variety of causes. In terms of Kathleen's case, the most significant development in SIDS research is the discovery that in certain cases, Infant deaths are brought on by previously undiagnosed genetic conditions. More than 30 different genes that increase the risk of SIDS and the related syndrome sudden unexplained death in children, which affects children over one year of age, have been identified. According to current estimates, up to 35% of deaths attributed to SIDS actually have a genetic component. A new group of lawyers took over Kathleen's case in 2013, and they hired several medical experts to review the data from the case. One of these experts was Stephen Cordner, a respected forensic pathologist at Monash University. He spent over a year reviewing the children's medical data and the arguments presented at Kathleen's trial, eventually producing a 112-page report that argued that the medical data pointed to the full big children dying of natural causes rather than by being smothered. This report was included with the official petition Kathleen's legal team filed in June of 2015 requesting that the Attorney General's office open a formal inquiry into the case. The petition was not addressed for three years. Finally, on August 22, 2018, Attorney General Mark Speakman announced that an inquiry overseen by former District Court Judge Reginald Blanche would be held. Kathleen's legal team hoped to be able to provide more solid evidence that the full big children had all died of natural causes and therefore began exploring genetic causes that could explain why all of Kathleen and Craig's children had died so young. At the time, they did not have access to the DNA profiles of the full big children, so they began their investigation by looking at Kathleen's DNA for clues. Professor Kerala Garcia de Venosa, the co-director of the Center for Personalized Immunology at the Australian National University, was asked by Kathleen's legal team to lead the effort. 
She and a geneticist worked with a cheek swab and saliva sample that had been collected from Kathleen in prison and had the DNA extracted from the samples sequenced. When they sat down to study the resulting DNA data, they noticed something that could potentially be of vital importance in the case. Kathleen had a mutation in her COM2 gene. The three COM genes relate to the production of calmodulin in the body. Calmodulin plays a role in how calcium is transported into and out of cells, including cells in the heart. As such, one of its functions involves regulating the contractions and expansions of the muscles in the heart. Mutations in these genes can result in severe inherited cardiac arrhythmias. Variants and COM genes were known causes of SIDS, as they could result in severe cardiac problems and sudden death in infants and young children. At the time it was discovered that Kathleen had this mutation, only about 75 people had been identified as having potentially lethal mutations in any of the three COM genes worldwide. The specific mutation found in Kathleen had not previously been identified or, therefore, linked to any deaths. Luckily, it was possible for Professor Vinoessa to follow up on this lead, as she was able to obtain DNA samples from all four of Kathleen's children. Two of the children had frozen tissue samples on file, and she was able to obtain DNA from the blood taken from the other two children at birth and preserved on their heel stick cards, which were still on file. Sequencing of their DNA showed that both Laura and Sarah Fulbig had inherited the mutation in the COM2 gene from Kathleen. While Kathleen's two sons, Patrick and Caleb, had not inherited this mutation, it was later discovered that they each had inherited two copies of another exceptionally rare mutation. In their cases, the variation affected a gene referred to as BSN or bassoon. Again, this mutation is very rare, but it is known to cause early onset lethal epilepsy in mice. That is, it causes mice to experience seizures that are severe enough to result in their death while they are still very young. The deaths of the four full big children appeared to not have a single cause, as the prosecution had alleged during Kathleen's trial, but two separate genetic influences. The chances of two such rare genetic variants being in one family and causing four deaths seem almost incomprehensibly small. According to Professor Vinoessa, the overall small odds of Kathleen and Craig both carrying rare mutations are not as relevant as the high odds of them passing those mutations onto their children. In the end, it's not about these variations being very rare in the world, it's about the chances of Kathleen meeting someone like Craig and having this combination of mutations between both of them. Once genetics come into play, statistics go out the window, she has stated. Because of the novelty of the specific mutation found in Kathleen and her daughters, doubts were raised during the inquiry about whether or not it could be fatal. A pediatric cardiologist who was called to testify during the inquiry argued that since Kathleen herself was healthy and had lived into adulthood, it was unlikely that her daughters had died as a result of the mutation they shared. Kathleen did have a history of fainting episodes that began when she was a child, including an incident where she fainted while swimming, but luckily was rescued from the water by witnesses. Fainting while swimming is a specific symptom associated with long cutie syndrome, which has been seen in individuals with calm mutations. However, during the inquiry, Kathleen was given an examination and found to not currently be showing any signs of cardiac problems, including long cutie syndrome. However, around this same time, evidence supporting the theory that the COM2 variant carried by Kathleen and her daughters could have been lethal emerged. Professor Vinoessa was able to contact cardiovascular geneticist Peter Schwartz, who had just completed a paper examining data from the International Calmodulin Registry, which attempts to gather information from every individual and family affected by mutations in COM genes. One of the families he wrote about was an American family with a mutation almost identical to the one shared by Kathleen and her daughters. The family's two children had each suffered cardiac arrest at a young age, one at age four and one at age five. One child survived the cardiac arrest, but the other, sadly, did not. It was determined that the children had inherited the mutation from their mother, who was healthy. Professor Vinoessa viewed the discovery of this other family as a major turning point in the case that provided strong evidence supporting Kathleen's innocence. Other scientists doing research for the inquiry did not view the new evidence as being so crucial, maintaining that the mutation found in the Fulbegs was likely pathogenic, but still not a likely explanation for Laura and Sarah's deaths, in part because of their young age at the time of their deaths and also because most deaths with cardiac causes tend to occur during highly active periods and the two girls had died in their sleep. 
Data from the International Calmodulin Registry does not necessarily support these critiques in cases where mutations in the COM genes are concerned. The registry describes five families in which their mutation was fatal in some members who inherited it, but not all of them. Approximately 20% of individuals who died of a sudden cardiac event related to these mutations died in their sleep, and nine sudden deaths occurred in children under the age of three. There was also a possibility that another form of stress besides exertion played a role in Laura and Sarah's deaths. Each of the girls had been sick and on medication when they died. Sarah had been prescribed an antibiotic for a cough and Laura had a respiratory infection that was being treated with acetaminophen and pseudoephedrine. The cardiovascular stress from being ill and the medication, in combination with the altered heart rhythm caused by the mutation, which left the girls more susceptible to heart problems, could have led to their sudden cardiac-related deaths. The scientific arguments did not impress Judge Reginald Blanche, who oversaw the inquiry. In July of 2019, he ruled that there was no reason to doubt Kathleen Fulbig's convictions while he acknowledged the scientific evidence presented at the inquiry and the possibility that Laura and Sarah had heart conditions. He wrote in his judgment, even on the basis of accepting the opinion of Professor Vinueza, that it is now plausible that Sarah and Laura Fulbig may have had a cardiac condition, and that that raises a possibility it caused their deaths. I do not consider the inquiry should be reopened for the purpose of holding further hearings about the COM2 variant identified in Sarah and Laura. As they had at her 2003 trial, Kathleen's diaries played a major role during the inquiry and in the judge's ruling. Kathleen's testimony during the inquiry to explain some of the passages used to point towards her guilt hurt her rather than helped her, in the judge's estimation. In reaching his verdict, Judge Blanche argued that, indeed, as indicated, the evidence which has emerged at the inquiry, particularly her own explanations and behavior in respect of her diaries, makes her guilt of these offenses even more certain. Many excerpts from the diaries are difficult to understand, but Kathleen has always maintained that they reflect the depression, lack of control, and paranoia she was feeling after losing multiple children. In October of 1997, she wrote about Laura wouldn't have handled another like Sarah. She saved her life by being different. Kathleen testified that she believed that her youngest daughter had not been taken from her so far because she was somehow different than her siblings. When Judge Blanche asked her if she believed some sort of supernatural power was taking her children from her, and she was hoping that Laura being somehow different prevented her from being taken by this power, she stated that she had believed something along those lines at the time. In discussing a January 1997 entry, in which she said she had done terrible things in the past when she was stressed, she stated, it's a broad spectrum of things that I am using the word terrible for. Could be me placing my child down to let her cry for even 30 seconds. That's a terrible thing in my view. Judge Blanche claimed that the diaries were virtual admissions of guilt. Six separate experts who have examined the diaries have all had the opposite opinion. The most recent expert to study the diaries, clinical and forensic psychologist Dr. Katie Seidler, who has worked with violent incarcerated offenders for over two decades, has stated there are no clear disclosures of any criminal or violent conduct in MS. Falbig's writings. Kathleen's legal team has also has long been critical of short, cherry-picked phrases and sentences taken from over 50,000 words of Kathleen's writing being highlighted in court without context. Following this loss in court, Kathleen's lawyers applied for a judicial review of the inquiry's findings. While they waited to get a response, more and more scientific evidence supporting the theory that Laura and Sarah Fulbig had died as a result of the variant in their COM2 gene they both inherited from their mother was discovered. A biochemist in Denmark, with aid from scientists from six countries, was able to run tests on this specific mutation using a synthetic cell and was able to show that it was just as likely to be lethal as the more well-known mutations in COM genes. A major scientific study was published in November 2020 confirming that Laura and Sarah's deaths were most likely caused by the mutation. Specifically, their deaths were brought on by the variations of their heart rhythms caused by the mutation, which left them vulnerable to cardiac problems in combination with the medications the girls had been taking. On March 3, 2021, a petition signed by more than 90 prominent scientists and medical professionals from nine countries was sent to New South Wales Governor Margaret Beasley requesting that Kathleen Fulbig be pardoned and freed from custody in light of the accumulating evidence that her children had died as the result of natural causes. Among those who signed the petition were two Nobel laureates and the President of the Australian Academy of Science. 
The petition argued that Kathleen Fulbig has endured the death of her four children and has been wrongfully incarcerated because the justice system has failed her by not properly taking the new scientific evidence into account. One of the signatories, John Shine, the president of the Australian Academy of Science, later stated, It is deeply concerning that there is not a mechanism to appropriately weigh up all the medical and scientific evidence in a case of this nature. There is now an alternative explanation for the death of the full big children that does not rely on circumstantial evidence. Three weeks after the petition was sent, the New South Wales Court of Appeal responded to the request for a judicial review of the Blanche inquest findings. They dismissed it, arguing that Judge Blanche's ruling was not at odds with scientific petition than the governor herself, did not seem to indicate that he would be in favor of granting the pardon. The Australian Academy of Science had offered to provide him with a panel of expert geneticists to help him go over the scientific data in the case, but he rejected this proposal. Still, on May 18, 2022, Attorney General Speakman announced that while Kathleen Fulbig would not be granted a pardon, a second public inquiry would be held to ascertain if there were any reasons to doubt her original conviction. He did not believe simply granting a pardon was appropriate because the new genetic evidence needed to undergo further scrutiny. While he had not formed an opinion on Kathleen's guilt or innocence or on whether or not there was reason to doubt her conviction, he did find that the scientific discoveries in the case did merit some form of intervention. When announcing the second inquiry, Speakman said that he had been in contact with Craig Volbig and that he was truly sorry that he would have to go through another inquiry. Craig Volbig believes that his ex-wife is guilty of murdering their children. Almost all of the further scientific inquiry into his children's deaths has focused on the COM2 mutation his daughters inherited from their mother, who provided a sample of her DNA to researchers. However, further research into the deaths of his two sons has been hampered by the fact that scientists do not have access to Craig Falbig's DNA. Caleb and Patrick both had two mutated copies of the bassoon gene in question, presumably because they inherited one from each of their parents. However, Mr. Falbig has refused to provide a sample of his DNA to confirm this. A directions hearing held in July 2022 found that Craig Falbig's DNA was of vital importance for the inquiry, as examining it would allow scientists to determine if Caleb and Patrick, who were confirmed to have inherited one mutated copy of the bassoon gene from their mother, had inherited their second mutated copy of the gene from their father or if it had been a de novo mutation. De novo mutations are not present in the parents of a child, they are instead spontaneous mutations in DNA that occur during early DNA replication of the child. Making this distinction would allow scientists to better determine if the mutation could be categorized as pathogenic or likely pathogenic. The lack of analysis of Craig Falbig's DNA limits the scope of the analysis of genetic factors in the deaths of his two sons. At the hearing, it was also found that Mr. Falbig could not be compelled to participate in the inquiry or provide a sample of his DNA. Mr. Falbig's refusal to participate in the inquiry is largely due to financial constraints. He does not have the money to finance his legal representation for the inquiry and says that rather than being given the necessary funds from the Attorney General's office, he was given the suggestion to take out a loan against his home to pay for his lawyer. Mr. Speakman says his office did approve the use of discretionary funds for Mr. Falbig's representation. However, according to Danny Ede, who previously represented Mr. Fulbig. This funding was limited and would only provide Mr. Fulbig with approximately eight days of representation, which is completely inadequate for an inquiry of this scale. The upcoming inquiry will be overseen by retired New South Wales Supreme Court Chief Justice, Tom Bathurst, Hurst, and will be conducted in two parts. The first part will take place in November of 2002 and examine the medical evidence in the case, and the second part will be held in February of 2023 to examine the psychological evidence. Regardless of the outcome of the inquiry and the credibility it may or may not give to the new genetic evidence, it will be a major moment in Australian legal history and shape the role science plays in the courtroom. If the new genetic evidence supporting the theory that the full big children died of natural causes is found to be valid, the inquiry will have to decide if circumstance or science is more important in the case. On September 28, 1979, a reporter at the Tahoe Tribune received a chilling anonymous call. The voice on the other end of the line told the reporter that there was a body at the Sugar Pine Point State Park in El Dorado County, California. Without hesitation, the reporter sprang into action 
and immediately alerted the sheriff's deputies. Detectives were quick to arrive at the scene, and to their horror, the tip turned out to be true. There, in the picnic area, lay the lifeless body of a woman. She appeared to be in her mid-thirties or early forties and wore a red shirt and jeans. Her golden wedding band shone brightly in the sunlight. Two other rings adorned her fingers and a necklace with what resembled a deer pendant hung around her neck. It was immediately evident to the detectives that the woman had met a violent end. She had clearly been beaten to death, and beside her body lay a single discarded flip-flop. The detective speculated that she had likely been chased through the park and lost her other flip-flop in the process. As they scoured the area for clues, the detective stumbled upon a beer bottle not far from the woman's body. They collected it as evidence, along with a sexual assault kit and a DNA sample. They also carefully searched the woman's clothing for any clues that might help identify her. But despite their thorough examination, they came up empty-handed. The woman had no means of identification on her person. With no immediate leads, the woman's body was removed from the scene and taken for an autopsy. The results of the examination were shocking. It was determined that the cause of death was strangulation and severe beating, confirming the detective's suspicions that she had been the victim of a brutal attack. Determined to uncover the identity of the woman and bring her assailant to justice, the detectives launched a full-scale investigation. They combed through missing person reports and interviewed witnesses in the area, determined to find any shred of evidence that could lead them to the perpetrator. As the investigation continued, the detectives were able to track down the individuals who made the initial call to the reporter. There were three of them, and they all explained that they had wanted to report it themselves, but feared arrest due to their outstanding warrants. None of them were held as suspects in the case. Despite numerous tips pouring in, the detectives were still unable to identify the slain woman. One particularly promising lead revealed that she had lived in a motel in South Lake Tahoe and had won a substantial sum of money playing Kino shortly before her murder. The detectives scoured local casinos for potential leads but came up empty-handed. As time passed, the case grew colder and no arrests were made. The identity of the woman remained unknown and she was buried in an unmarked grave in Tahoma, California. Simply labeled as unknown female, it was a tragic end for a woman whose life had been cut short by a senseless act of violence. The case of the unidentified woman remained a thorn in the side of detectives for decades, until 2014 when a new lead emerged. Detective John Gaines, a member of the Colt Case Homicide Unit of El Dorado County, took up the challenge of solving the mystery that had remained unsolved for so long. As he delved deeper into the case, he discovered an overlooked piece of evidence, and this was the necklace worn by the victim. It had been previously classified as a deer necklace, but Detective Gaines recognized it as a chai necklace, a Hebrew symbol that means life. This revelation sparked an idea in his mind. The victim might have been Jewish. With this knowledge in hand, the detectives reached out to the Jewish community for help in solving this case. They contacted several Jewish centers in the area, including the Shabbat Jewish Center of Lake Tahoe and a Shabbat Center covering Folsom, Placerville, and other nearby regions. Photographs of the victim's jewelry were also published in a Jewish newspaper, in the hope that someone would recognize and provide a clue that could crack the case wide open. The renewed investigation breathed new life into the case, and the detectives remained hopeful that they would finally unravel the mystery that had eluded them for so long. In 2015, detectives finally caught a break in the case. A 61-year-old woman saw the photographs of the jewelry in the newspaper and recognized it as the type her mother used to wear. She reached out to detectives believing that the unidentified woman might be her mother, who went by the name Patricia Carnahan. To confirm this, detectives exhumed the unidentified woman's body to take a DNA sample for testing. When the DNA of the unidentified woman and the 61-year-old woman claiming to be her daughter were compared, it was a match. The mystery of the woman's identity had been solved. She was indeed Patricia Carnahan. Further investigation revealed that Patricia was from Virginia and had been 35 years old when she met her end. In 1979, she had been visiting California in her red Volkswagen bus, traveling alone. Her family had lost contact with her at some point, and her Volkswagen was later found abandoned at a car dealership in Venice. 
California. Her family had reported her missing about a month after her death, of which they were unaware. With Patricia's identity finally confirmed, her body was released to her family for a proper burial, finally giving them a bit of closure after more than three decades of not knowing what had happened to her. After finally uncovering the identity of the mysterious victim, detectives were left with an even greater mystery. Who had killed Patricia? They had to find the killer and bring justice to the victim. With determination in their hearts, the detectives delved into the case. They started by testing the DNA sample collected from Patricia's body all those years ago. And finally, a DNA profile was developed. Upon testing the beer bottle found near the body, they discovered that the DNA matched the one found in Patricia's body. This confirmed that the killer had used the bottle. Despite uploading the DNA profile to Cody's, the detectives were left disappointed when they found no match, but they refused to give up. In the year 2022, the Washington State Attorney General's office decided to take on the mammoth task of addressing the backlog of untested sexual assault kits in the state. Among the 1,500 untested kits sitting in the Spokane Police Department storage room were the remains of a 1994 sexual assault case. The case involved a homeless woman who accused a man named Harold Carpenter of assaulting her. Healthcare workers had collected evidence as part of a sexual assault kit and detectives arrested Carpenter at that time. But the case took a strange turn when Carpenter claimed that the sex was consensual and that the woman had stolen his wallet. The detectives collected DNA from Carpenter before releasing him from jail. But their investigation was suspended later that week when they lost contact with a woman. For decades, the woman's sexual assault kit sat untested until August 2022, when it was sent to the Washington State Patrol Crime Lab as a part of the Washington State Sexual Assault Kit Initiative. In early February 2023, Spokane police detectives were jolted by an incredible revelation. A forensic scientist with the Washington State Patrol Crime Lab reached out to them that the DNA from the 1994 case had been uploaded to the FBI's DNA database, Coitus, and it had matched the DNA evidence collected from none other than Patricia's case. And this meant that the suspect in her murder was Carpenter, the man accused of the 1994 sexual assault. With this news, the detectives dug deeper into Carpenter's past and discovered that he had been arrested in Susanville, California on September 29, 1979, on suspicion of driving under the influence just one day after Patricia's body was found. He had been released to the Bonneville County Sheriff in Idaho, where he served time for an unrelated burglary charge. Carpenter's criminal record was extensive, including several misdemeanors and arrests in Bonner County from 1998 to 2018, such as drug possession, disturbing the peace, reckless driving and driving under the influence the story of Carpenter's life took an even darker turn when the detectives discovered that he had been homeless in Spokane since around 2016 and had moved into the Park Tower Apartments, a low-income building for elderly and disabled people shockingly. In 2018, Carpenter was a prime suspect in another sexual assault case in Spokane County and, to make matters worse, he was also suspected of an unwanted sexual touching incident in 2022, but no arrest was made in either case. On February 27, 2023, the Spokane Police in collaboration with the El Dorado County Cold Case Task Force made a long and awaited arrest. After more than four decades of evading justice, 63-year-old Carpenter was finally apprehended. He was booked into the Spokane County Jail charged with being a fugitive and is awaiting extradition to California, where he will face a murder charge. The next day, Carpenter made his first court appearance in Spokane, where he was remanded in custody on a $1 million bail. Although the statute of limitations has expired in the 1994 sexual assault case and the victim has since passed away, authorities remain resolute that Patricia's murder case will continue to move forward and Carpenter will finally be held accountable for his heinous crimes. 47-year-old Ralph Stutzman was a married father of 13 children who owned a farm in La Grange County, Indiana. On August 17, 1952, he left his house to go out to his barn and never returned. Rumors about his disappearance swirled in his community for decades, which was very upsetting to his family. His wife, as well as several of his children, passed away without ever learning what became of him. On June 16, 2023, more than 70 years after Ralph disappeared, 
the Grange County Sheriff's Detective Stephanie Mickham announced at a press conference that his case had been solved. Sometime after he vanished in Indiana, he moved to Florida where he lived under the name Delbert Schrock and had six more children before passing away in 1968. In 2022, a woman given the pseudonym of Crystal in the press submitted her DNA to Ancestry.com in hopes of finding her biological parents. She believed she was a descendant of Ralph Stutzman of Indiana, but the site identified her grandfather as Delbert Schrock of Florida because his daughter Ruth had used the service and uploaded her DNA profile to their site. Crystal contacted a genealogist named Randy Davis to help investigate this unexpected result. After doing more research and realizing that Ralph Stutzman had disappeared before Delbert Schrock appeared in public records, Randy reached out to Detective Mickham to tell her he had a lead in a decades-old disappearance. She was initially suspicious but did her own investigating into the Stoltzman case. When she realized Randy may have been onto something, she requested that Ralph's daughter, Mary, provide a DNA sample. Mary's DNA sample confirmed that she and Ruth, the woman living in Florida, were half-sisters. Mary Stutzman Boyd is now 92 years old and suffering from memory issues. Her family does not believe she fully comprehends what has transpired, but they are relieved she finally has some answers about her father, even if she does not fully understand them. According to her son, Ben Boyd, who was just five years old when his grandfather disappeared, for years years, she always said that she would like to know what happened to her dad before she died. I think for the whole family, it's just a relief to know what really happened to him and that he's not laying in some ditch somewhere and deteriorating away. Ralph's reasons for leaving his first family remain unknown. Some members of the family he had while living as Delbert Trock watched the press conference via Zoom and were able to virtually meet the members of the Stoltzman family who were in attendance in person in Indiana. They were shocked by the revelation that the man they had known as Delbert had another family. Many members of both sides of the family hoped to get together for a family reunion to meet in person sometime soon. On April 26, 2023, a farmer was digging a ditch on his farmland off Coxmoor Road, Sutton in Ashfield, Nottinghamshire when he made a terrible discovery. Between four and six feet underground, he discovered human bones. Unintentionally, the farmer had just solved a 56-year-old mystery. Traumatic injuries to the skull led an anthropologist to determine that the bones belonged to a murder victim. Initial DNA inquiries made by police did not help them identify the remains. Then they released images of a shoe and distinctive socks found with the remains, which were seen and recognized by a man named Russell Lowbridge. Russell contacted police believing the remains may have been those of his long-missing grandfather. Russell and one of his uncles provided samples of their DNA and testing confirmed that the remains were those of Russell's grandfather, Alfred Swinsco. Alfred was a native of Pinkston on the border of Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire. He became known as the champion pigeon man of Pinkston as a result of his love of pigeon racing. He went to work in the local coal mine at the age of 14. He was able to work his way up to one of the better paying positions at the mine, but frequently gave away any extra money he had to friends and relatives in need. Alfred was married and was the loving father of six children. By 1967, 54-year-old Alfred was a grandfather as well. On the evening of January 27th that year, he went out to the local miners arms pub with two of his sons and some friends. He was last seen around 10.30 p.m. when he gave his son some money to buy the next round of drinks and then stepped outside to relieve himself. He never came back inside. While Alfred's entire family was distraught over his disappearance, his son Gary, who had been with him at the pub the night he went missing, was particularly affected by it. He spent decades reaching out to agencies, hiring a private detective, and performing searches of his own, going into abandoned wells and searching local fields. Gary shared his father's love of pigeon racing and continued the hobby well after his father disappeared. He unfortunately passed away in November of 2012 following a short illness, never getting the answers about his father's fate that he spent decades searching for. According to Russell Lowbridge, it completely broke him, never knowing what happened to his dad. I want justice for Gary because he tried so hard to get answers. It tormented him up until the day he died.
The Swensko family plans to bury Alfred's remains alongside Gary so that father and son can in some way be reunited. While Alfred's disappearance has been solved, the news that he was murdered has created new questions that now need answers. A murder investigation has officially been opened in the case. Alfred's family appeared on BBC's Crime Watch to appeal to the public for help. The coal mine where Alfred worked has since closed, and as it was a major employer in the area, a large number of people who lived there at the time of Alfred's murder have since moved. The family hopes that national media coverage will help reach former residents of the area who may have relevant information but now live elsewhere. Alfred's remains were found some five miles away from where he was last seen. According to investigators, this is an important detail because it indicates that his killer had access to a car, which very few members of the community did back in 1967. Four of Alfred's six children are still living and desperate for answers about who took their father from them. Alfred's now 82-year-old daughter Julie told the press, Someone, somewhere will have some information, and we would urge them to get in touch with the police. We might be able to now give my dad the funeral he deserves, but we don't have the answers we desperately want. Someone killed my dad, and I want to know why. I need to know why. Thank you for joining us on this journey into the depths of unsolved mysteries. Cold cases not only challenge our understanding of the past, but also ignite our curiosity and determination for answers. Remember to subscribe to stay updated on our latest investigations. And if you have any information regarding the cases we've covered, don't hesitate to reach out. Together, we can shed light on the shadows of the past and bring closure to those who seek it. Until next time, stay vigilant, stay curious, and never stop seeking the truth.